Right, last but not least, we have Declan Rudin uh, from Customer Verification Solutions. He's head of security testing at TVS. Declan actually spoke at uh, Eurostar last November and, and uh, well, not only won best paper, but won best talk as well at Eurostar, so he's well worth listening to. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, we'll keep you wide awake right to the very end. Uh, he's, he's quite passionate about testers knowing about or understanding security testing. And, and in our experience, certainly most test engineers don't know very much about security testing, if anything at all. So over to Declan. Thanks, Jim. Um, just in case I run out of time at the end, I'm going to start with my ending story, because I think it's a story I like to tell. And I've never given this talk before. I haven't fully rehearsed the timing, so let's get this out of the way, because I like the story. Back in the 1970s, um, my father was consulted by a doctor in a professional capacity regarding a patient that this doctor was more worried about than any patient he'd ever had in his life. Uh, the, the patient um, was a very smart, well-dressed guy, had a good job, uh, was a skilled, experienced professional. Uh, but he was also an alcoholic, and he wasn't responding to treatment. And he was also a pilot for Dan Air flying out of Catholic Airport every week. And the doctor was terrified this guy was going to kill a large number of people. Um, but he also knew that under the laws of patient confidentiality, he couldn't really do much about it. Uh, so he consulted my father, who had the ability to lock the guy up for four days' observation, uh, psychiatric observation. But unless he turned out to be mad as well as alcoholic, he was going to be flying again on day five. So they had a dilemma, and what they decided to do was use the doctor's headed note paper to write to the personnel department and say, one of your pilots is an alcoholic. I mean, at the time, Aeroflot was the only airline that breathalyzed their pilots before they took off. God knows what state they were in when they landed. <laughs> I mean, I, I flew Aeroflot once, and they just left a big pile of crates of beer in the middle of the plane, and you could help yourself. And there was no seat numbering, even. Was, and, and if you didn't get a seat, you could fly sitting on the floor or standing up. And I've actually seen the plane land with people standing up talking to each other, and they just all fall on the ground and pick themselves up, and life goes on. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a bizarre business. But uh, I felt there was a parallel with this. In my, most of my work in my 34 years in IT, 27 years in testing, um, so many projects were going live with very little regard to security testing. And, and my, I myself was very weak on security testing until about five years ago, and I started learning a lot more about it. And it was as though you know, putting all these projects live without much regard to security was like letting those planes fly with an alcoholic pilot. And I, my, so my speaking in public is a way of trying to raise awareness that there's a problem. And uh, I first spoke in March last year. I don't know if I'm going to carry on speaking, because my objective was to, to win a prize at Eurostar. Uh, which, which I did, but um, just relating this to my normal job as a test manager, I mean, this may not be 100% correct. I mean, people could argue that uh, DevOps is, is agile, but it, in my mind, I, it, it helps me explain to project managers and heads of IT and so on, like, before I can tell them what my test strategy is, they have to decide what their development framework is. And, and amazingly, some project managers have really struggled with even that basic step. But they, they say it's agile, but actually, in any way you could examine it, it's iterative. Uh, and, um, but but to, to, to my mind, like, continuous delivery is a bit different to agile, but maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, this diagram helps. And as Rob uh, pointed out earlier, uh, under DevOps, you know, you've got extensive automation, but you can also have exploratory. And um, you, I mean, many organizations will probably end up going the ISO, IEC, IEEE, 29119 software standard for testing. I, know, but I wouldn't like to do that myself, but some people will be made to. And, and you, can, you can sort of put things in boxes and say, OK, yeah, I can conceptualize this, and it helps me solve the problem. And I wanted to do that with security. And I've, with the help of uh, the Open Web Application Security Project's latest testing guide, version 4, it's possible to put security into sort of 17 boxes. But that helps me conceptualize the problem. Because uh, in so many places I've worked, security testing has been just two of these boxes, which uh, is some, some very last-minute penetration testing, possibly when the system's already gone live. And it's very unstructured. It's not, uh, it's not well managed. It's the relationship between the penetration testers, who might well be external, and 
and the project team is, is not just based on trust, it's based on total ignorance. We don't know what they're really doing, and when they report back, uh, they tend to report the same sort of things, like reflected cross-site scripting, SQL injection, path traversal, and so on. But I didn't understand what those things even were five years ago, so I needed to learn more about it. The other thing that's very common is uh, reviewing the code, particularly using uh, an automated code vulnerability scanner, and that would be traditionally um, static analysis while the project's in development, and then when the code is more or less fully built, then some dynamic analysis, because there are vulnerabilities that only appear when the code is actually run. Uh, and there's a great deal of confidence placed in those automated uh, code vulnerability scanning tools, a great deal of it. Uh, but for me, I feel like the security testing and security as a whole, there's, there's much more to it, and, and we need to start at the beginning. So what's the systems development lifecycle process? I was at an uh, Institute of Information Security Professionals uh, Congress last year in London, and a lot of these guys are a particular type of person. There's certified information system security professionals. The ones being made uh, like fellows of the ISP um, are, are kind of like the grey-bearded guys who've, who've come up through working with the government in Cheltenham and so on, GCHQ, and they, they're used to great big government projects and a sort of a waterfall remodel approach to security. And uh, they're in close to total panic about Agile. They don't know how to work in Agile projects, but they're being expected to do so. Um, so that's interesting. But I don't see there's any reason why security could not be in an Agile or a DevOps project any more than it would be in a waterfall or, um, or a V-model. I mean, people don't seem to talk about the V-model so much anymore. I know it was, uh, we just heard about it, but uh, I've noticed that um, a lot of Agileisters uh, sort of say everything was waterfall, including the Rational Unified Process Iterative was waterfall as well. So I'd love it if people from DevOps started saying that Agile was waterfall, because that uh, have that. Um, so uh, it, 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 these things have advantages. So with, with a waterfall or B-model-y type approach, then uh, you tend to have good documentation, or at least some sort of documentation up front, but you could use this as the basis for quite a lot of analysis and planning. and um, there tends to be more time for security up front, uh, at least in the thinking about it. And, and, and the traditional uh, sort of professionals are, are comfortable with that. And, and it's appropriate for back in the day when systems couldn't be updated online with security patches. It would make sense to put a lot of effort in at the beginning to try to get to that sort of zero defects delivery as best as you can. But um, a lot of these architectural decisions are taken very early, before even a single line of code is written. And, uh, and then it can be difficult to sort of stick to that line when a lot of changes have emerged as the project's developing. And um, it, it tends to end up, one of the big problems with waterfall projects is that everybody's slipping all the way along the line, but they don't want to give up on that delivery date. So security testing, like all the other testing, gets really compressed and squeezed. And, and then that would lead to like not the best solutions to fixing those problems. You might end up just blacklisting, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and so on because it's a quick and dirty way of solving the problem. It doesn't solve the root cause of the problem. And of course maintenance, um, you know, maybe the guy who, who wrote the code left or died or something. It could have been years in development. And, uh, and that's why something like Agile and DevOps and so on, um, it's much easier to fix a vulnerability that's found in a security vulnerability that was just written a few days ago or a few weeks ago. The person who produced it is probably still with you. And you could you could say, right, okay, we need to solve this. Oh, yeah, I remember how I did that, rather than, oh, my God, there's no documentation. Who did this? And oh, it should have been sacked, so on. Um, and, uh, and and you can, you can adapt along the way, making architectural decisions to security as you go. Uh, but in my opinion, um, the weakness is the project team might be missing a lot of non-functional expertise, unless they're, you're going out to silos of experts for security and performance and so on. The, the project team might be working pretty much solo as regards to security knowledge. And, and I'm going to qualify this. I'm saying an over-reliance on automation, and I'm not anti-automation. I think it brings a great deal to the party, including for security. But I'm going to explain later where I think the danger lies in that. So what drives security? Well, a large part of it is driven by um, standards and, and to some extent legislation there. So the Data Protection Act is a legal obligation to, to have some level of security to protect the confidentiality and the integrity and the availability of your data. 
particularly relating to persons. Um, there's all kinds of things here. The, the FRC rules are replacing this Turnbull report to, to prevent like, directors of companies using the defense in court, which was successfully used by many like the Maxwell brothers to say, well, we just didn't know what's going on. You know, now there are rules that mean if you end up in court because there's been some gigantic data breach, um, you can't say we didn't understand it because it's a, a, a requirement that you actually manage all risk and security is a risk. Um, they don't have to, executives don't have to personally manage it, but they have to make sure that somebody is doing that. Um, in back, I haven't got the, the picture of it, but in the United States, the, uh, Barack Obama, the president of America, has uh, said that he wants any data breach that occurs, he wants the affected persons to be informed within 28 days. Now, I'd like to tell you what more famous people have said about security, but the Pope told me not to drop names. Um, but here we've got at the top there the, the new comprehensive reform of data protection law going through the European Parliament. It should have been passed in March this year, but the EU is somewhat bureaucratic and it's now looking at the end of the year. And it will then take another two years before the rules are enforced. But you should have a quick look at some of these. I mean, I've, I've, you know, obviously it's a massive document. I've condensed it to some extent. And that, that right to be forgotten, people are talking about that on the radio quite a lot. So that's, that's pretty well known. But down the bottom here, I think, is something that will be a very strong driver for data security. Uh, the data protection authorities will be empowered to fine companies that violate EU data protection rules can lead to penalties of up to 1 million euros or up to 2% of the global annual turnover of the company. So that's not profit, that's the annual turnover. Imagine if like Facebook or, or Amazon or something like that was having frequent breaches that they were getting fined 2% of global turnover. You, you could destroy any business just by fining it within a year. Um, so, so the standards plus like the business case and uh, the, the sort of costs that, that are involved in data breaches are driving, even at the executive level, to do something about security. Now, uh, a lot of people want to say, well, what's security going to cost? You know, like, how, what, what, what's it, how much does it cost you to do something about it and how much does it cost if we don't do anything about it? And uh, institutes like the Ponemon Institute have tried to put an actual price on the breach per record. But uh, Verizon have, have said it's not as simple as that. There's actually like a range of prices. And, and I think most companies take the optimistic low figure. But you know, if you lose 100 records, it's maybe only just over $1,000. If you lose like 100 million, then it might be $392,000. Um, so there's certain economies of scale there, but not the sort of ones you really want to be harvesting. Uh, but of course, at the, the, at the worst end, you might lose 100 records and, and it cost over half a million dollars. Uh, yeah, that's total cost for all 100 records or all 100,000 records. Um, it's still a lot of money. And uh, I think, you know, it, if you were asked how much is it going to cost, you know, I, you could say, well, it's take your pick. But um, it would depend on the context of the organization and so on. And, and uh, it, it, it's very hard to say it's exactly X dollars for such and such a, a breach. But at least be aware that there are costs. And, uh, and for the attackers, they don't care much about you know, what your recovery procedures are and so on. They can just go to the, uh, the dark web, which is not the same as the deep web. And um, Silk Road's been shut down. Silk Road 2's been shut down. But there's always these uh, uh, criminal marketplaces springing up in the dark web where they can buy not only drugs and guns, they can buy malicious software. But for, say, $20, you could hijack tens of thousands of innocent bystanders' servers and then target an attack on somebody's business who might have a multi-million dollar perimeter defense system of firewalls and intrusion prevention, intrusion detect detection, and so on. And you could bring it down with a $20 script. So for them, the economics work very much in their favor. It's worth having a go. Uh, and unfortunately, on our side, most of the money in, in security is spent on perimeter defenses. So that, but the architecture level, the intrusion detection and so on, the most security teams are actually part of the network architecture team and they're focused on looking at monitoring tools and so on. The, the money's not being spent at the web application layer. And that's the, the level that's actually most likely to be attacked because that's where the money is. They don't want to bring the network down. They want to get into the applications, then get to the data and exploit it in some way. So I think there's huge potential to shift some of the spending onto the applications and then like, reap the benefits and try and turn the tables. So there's a, there's a the, the kind of um, 
asymmetric economics work in, in our favor rather than theirs. So it costs them at least $11 to steal $10, and then a lot of them will just go away. Um, so these kind of drivers uh, will, uh, will result in most companies, mature companies in particular, having security policies. And uh, you already have like an email policy. There'd be something saying you cannot put, you know, customers are scum in your company emails. But you could also have an email policy that um, you don't click on attachments from strangers that are sent uh, into your company and so on. It'd only be partially effective, but th that is a big cause of problems. Um, you don't email your username and password to anybody, that sort of thing. Uh, secure, most of this stuff could be written by anyone who likes writing stuff about process, except for the secure application development. That stuff you actually have to know how to secure applications. Uh, and that's harder, and there's not many people do know. Um, but uh, coming back to this security development uh, uh, life cycle, we've talked about the SDLC process, the standards, and the policies that can be the drivers towards how you implement application security. Uh, but you also, of course, have requirements. There's actually what is it the thing is supposed to do, and, and then how do we design and model that? So um, if, you took, if you had a use case, we want users to be able to log in then you could think of a misuse case, which is like the sort of counterpart to that. Of, well, a hacker is, is going to want to try and break in, even though we don't want them to come in. And how would they do that? Well, uh, they'll try and brute force it. So how do we prevent that? Uh, OK, well, we will show a generic error message. We won't show an error message that says you've got the password wrong or we've got the new username wrong, which is then helping them uh, enumerate whether they're getting the right usernames or passwords and so on. And uh, you know, maybe they'll try a dictionary attack of like every name in the every name that they can think of and every uh, word in the dictionary and so on. But you could lock them out after n failed attempts, and you can make sure that that's, that validation is applied on the server end as well as the client side because they'll own the client side and be able to manipulate it and every parameter in there they want, and so on. So you could you can create uh, test requirements for security, and then you could design in and and there's actually many uh, secure design principles, and I, this is about as many as I could fit on a PowerPoint slide. Um, but certainly, you know, earn but never assume trust. They have to validate everything as it's coming in, and on its way out. There could be second or SQL injections that make it to your database and only form into malicious code on the way back out when they're being used by a different application. Um, always consider the users. Don't make security so onerous that people don't use the system anymore or they work around it. Um, Fail securely. I'm going to talk about an example shortly uh, of a system, a very big system that did not fail securely. Okay, and then there are security models. So anyone who's a CISSP would be familiar with these models, but you know, in the project team, you probably wouldn't know them, and this is an area where you could probably get uh, professional advice. So uh, this is the, I guess, the most important part of my talk, really, the bit that I think is mostly new information to people. Is review the code. This thing that uh, you know, you just you can get a plug and play solution there, and um, I think uh, people want a silver bullet for security. They want to they want to just buy something where they can push a button and a report will come out saying, yeah, these are these are your security problems. And uh, you know, I thought, well, my God, if that's true, you know, we could do this for all testing. You know, I could get one of those jobs as the head of all testing, where you just sack all the testers. And you do that. You've got one of these tools because if they can find all the security bugs, then they're the hardest ones to find. So, right, it, it's going to be easy to find all the rest of the bugs. So how the hell do they do it? And and uh, I started looking under the hood, like, well, how does that stuff work? And and there's uh, there's a nice piece of research done by a guy called Shay Chen and the website's uh, Sec Tool Market, and he gives a breakdown. He's he's analysed loads and loads of, of scanning tools, and and they get a score. Uh, and there's kind of like seven columns there. So uh, web injection, SQL injection, uh, reflective cross-site scripting, local file inclusion, remote file inclusion, and so on. And, and some of these things are getting 100%. So IBM App Scan, 100% on quite a few of those things. Uh, HP Web Inspect, that's the, that's the dynamic code uh, analysis tool. The, the HP Fortify is the static one. Um, these are fantastic scores. But then it hasn't got the price of the HP thing, but I guess it won't come as any surprise to you to know that HP is actually really expensive. Um, slightly cheaper than IBM. Uh, but you could say, oh, wait a minute, you know, Accutex, they're like 
virtually the same score, but like way, way cheaper. Why don't we go with a Unitex? And then you could think, oh, we could wait and save even more money. We could get uh, Burt Street Professional. It's actually 200 pounds. Um, uh, or I could actually not get the professional version, and it's zero. It's absolutely free. So which one should I pick? So like, maybe I should try and understand these things better. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized these, and I'm not comparing like with like here. These things at the top um, are, are literally the push button standalone solutions. And the things at the bottom tend to be more the interactive security testing tools. So what's the difference? Well, there's automated push button scanners. Uh, the way they work is to, to have a crawler module. It's the, you seed it with URLs, and then it retrieves all the pages that it can find, follows the links, and redirects them to identify all the reachable pages and input points. But straight away, you've got a problem. Um, and, and to some extent, they've made a concession. So with HP, uh, they, they allow, uh, they've got a browser uh, add-on so that you can actually guide it through the logging process and, get, and so that you can get through authentication. But um, it could very easily get lost doing that. There's, uh, there's a lot of like multi-stage logins and multi-stage processes that they don't, they, because it's just following a script, it's a generic tool, it can't reach those pages. Uh, and if this gets into something like an Amazon or a Facebook website, there are probably only a few dozen actual functions, but there are many, many millions of pages that will all look different to the tool. So it will just go bashing its way through them for ages and ages, not really doing any useful work. Uh, and some applications um, will generate a, a URL as you use it dynamically, and then it will keep thinking, oh, this is another new page, another new page. It will keep in, enter an infinite loop. Same as if you've got a calendar function. Um, where uh, you know it, 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 you can get dates into infinity, we keep thinking it's it's discovering new content. Um, but let, let's assume that it does actually manage to map the application properly. Uh, then there's the attack module, basically uh, generates values like to trigger a vulnerability. So it like pumps a load of stuff into every input field it can find, and it's it's sort of a fuzzing technique. Um, but you know there, there are things uh, that I sort of described as. That, that, that's not a very uh, good approach, and um, it, I, I'll explain why in a moment. And then there's the analysis module, uh, examining responses uh, to, to attacks by signature recognition, which is the same way the perimeter defenses work. Just looking, you know, is this in my catalog of known problems? Okay, then it's a, then it's a, an issue. Um, so, so what are we good at? Uh, Right, well, the, the uh, standalone scanners are, are good at cross-site scripting, SQL injection, path traversal, and so on. You, I won't just read the list out. But I expect that when you get a report from one of these companies, they'll almost always list those problems. But those are not all security problems. Those are just the things that they're good at doing. Uh, and it'd be very surprising if you don't see those in the report. Uh, so of course, I'm not going to turn this into a tutorial of, of what is cross-site scripting and so on, but, but basically, the browser has trusted the, um, the web server too much, and that web server is infected or owned in some way by the attacker. And if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about what these are in detail, you could look at the uh, TBS website, and we've got free documents available that fully describe um, application security testing procedures, application security development guidelines that will explain in full, this is where that screenshots come from, uh, what reflective cross-site scripting is. But of course, there's still stored cross-site scripting and document object model cross-site scripting, which are different types of cross-site scripting these tools are not so good at. Uh, injection, we talked about, they're good at some, some SQL injection, some command injection, and so on, but many types of injection. But these are the sort of things that the, the standalone automated scanners should be finding. I wanted to give you a path traversal example because people hardly ever talk about path traversal. So imagine a user can input a value like diagram1.jpg, and uh, it, the system will then go to uh, a file location, see example images, and uh, then read diagram1 and, and, and show it to the client. But an attacker would say, I'm going to try uh, path traversal, dot, dot, dash, dot, dot, dash, windows, repair, sand. And then it, the application is going to go to that path if, if the developer has not prevented path traversal and get to the SAM file. Does, does everybody know what a SAM file is? Windows SAM file? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's the Security Accounts Manager. And um, actually, until Windows XP, when Microsoft fixed it, attackers could go to the SAM file, delete it, and then it would fail open, which is that design principle I talked about earlier. So you could log in with any username and no password at all into any Microsoft 
Windows application before XP fixed the problem. Now, you know, obviously we've moved on from XP, but there's a lot of people out there building applications who are even worse developers than the Microsoft ones. And uh, you know, there's loads more problems that will come to example in, in, in years to come. Uh, so what goes wrong with automated scanners? Well, uh, yeah, if you've got any kind of rudimentary defenses in place by the developers who think they know about security, then often these automated scanners won't work their way past them. Uh, the, the, um, the, vulnerability, the, the vulnerabilities that are triggered may not be recognized by the signature database. And um, things like broken access controls don't have a standard signature. So if a clerk can reach an administrator privilege, that doesn't mean anything to these scanners. Uh, they don't understand the meaning of changing parameters in the application. Like a human being would think, OK, if I change my order quantity, that's not really a security vulnerability. It just increases the order. But if I can change the item price, that means a great deal. I could bring the item price down to a penny or a negative value or something like that. But to the automated scanners, all parameters are just parameters. It doesn't understand what the parameters do. Uh, logic flaws, they're no good at finding logic flaws. Um, the design vulnerabilities, uh, you know, the design vulnerabilities again don't have a signature. So um, things like if you have uh, weak uh, password rules and so on. Um, and uh, something like if there's predictable session parameters, uh, se predictable session tokens, um, it'd be possible to hijack somebody's, to uh, hijack somebody's session by predicting the session. And uh, that doesn't mean anything again. It would, even if they started guessing sessions, it, it wouldn't know it's in another session. And sensitive information from logs and so on could all be uh, going out there, and the tools don't, don't see it. Um, and there have been attempts to try and solve that by cranking these tools up to be more intelligent. But actually, artificial intelligence is nowhere near the level it needs to be to do this. It's not at human levels yet. So what you get is loads of false positives, which waste everybody's time looking at them, and lots of false negatives, which induce false confidence. Um, and what they're doing, what they're really doing is just finding some of the low-hanging fruit, not even all of the low-hanging fruit. Uh, and because every web application is different, these tools are generic. Uh, they go for syntax rather than the semantic meaning. Uh, they're not good at improvisation like a human is, and they don't have intuition. And a human might spot some smoke signals, think, oh, this is a multi-stage process. And if I do this, and if I jump past this process and set some flags, I might jump straight to a payment of somebody else's account and so on like that. They can't think like that. There are interactive security testing tools, like the ones I'm listing up here, where a penetration tester or someone who's security savvy can uh, use them. And they could use an intercepting proxy, for example, to like, step between the client and the server end and examine all the content and change things which the developers may never have expected would change. And, and they can still do the, whoops, they can still do the scanning job uh, that these standalone scanners do, but they do it intelligently and interactively. And once you've got those scripts, you can then automate them. You can automate intelligent, interactive security testing. Uh, but there will still be an exploratory nature to security. Uh, but a lot of the tests can be automated. But I don't agree with automating like dumb push-button solutions. I think it's very dangerous. It, it's produced a lot of false confidence in the industry. People insist they don't need any. Um, security testing because they've done a scan and they only had some reflective cross-site scripting and some secret injection problems and they've fixed those and everything's beautiful. Uh, I'm running out of time so I'm going to, glad I did tell you the story at the start about the drunk pilot, but uh, the um, maintenance, I've got to make this point because this is, this is not at all uh, new thinking, but we should be maintaining systems for security. And there's a thing called the Common Vulnerability Enumeration Database, for example, where you could type in JavaScript, and it comes back with 984 known JavaScript problems where there are fixes available. And yet, in uh, Verizon's research that just published this year, um, they looked at the vulnerabilities exploited in 2014, the things that actually uh, led to breaches, and found that 99.9% .9 of exploited vulnerabilities were compromised more than a year after the CVE was published. So these things are known problems. The fix is out there, and people just aren't bothering to apply them. So the security development life cycle is a big mess from start to finish. We're not gathering the requirements properly. We're not building them right. We're not even maintaining them right. Um, so that's it. We're kind of out of time. But I'm thinking, you know, I can't do much to help you. But, you know, 
there are drunk pilots getting in planes, and there's non-secure applications going live. And uh, you know, I've done what I can to help. I've raised some awareness. Okay. Right. Good. Time for just a few questions. Any questions from Bethany? Yeah, I'll hang about, I'm like. Oh, I'm from the other. Okay. Did they find that pilot? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bethany. Oh, oh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't. And one thing you didn't mention in there was uh, sort of social engineering. So, uh, it, you know, in my experience, you can have the, the most protected, well secure software in the world, but you still have that human element that's capable of destroying everything that you've built. So, one of the systems we worked on was an online voting system where the person who could bring it all down was the postman who was carrying those electronic signatures, basically. Do you think it's, I mean, in that example, we built a very secure system, but it made it unusable. The question is, do you think we'll ever get to the point where you can have a super secure system that's super usable at the same time? Uh, we generally don't tend to yeah, with each other. Probably not. I don't actually believe there's any such thing as an unhackable system. There's just a system that you could make uneconomic to hack. But yeah, it's all people, process, and technology. And that people part is actually the biggest problem. But, but a lot of breaches are the result of effectively social engineering or in some way tricking people into providing their usernames and passwords, and then they start the, the attacker will start using the system. But uh, there's a lot to be done in access controls in terms of like making sure that person can only go so far. Uh, what actually happens is they get in maybe as somebody with a clerical role, and then work their way up into an administrator privilege, and and, and that's when like really bad things happen. That's what attackers want to get to. It's not so easy to trick an administrator into giving out their username and password as as like a more gullible person. Um, it can happen, but I believe um, that uh, access controls are about as good as you can get in the technology area uh, and the process area, but the people area is, is a big problem. And yeah, I mean, you get uh, Private Bradley Manning, you know, he's like one of the lowest paid guys in the US Army, embarrassing the, 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 the chief of the army because he just puts a load of stuff on a memory stick and walks out the building and gives it to WikiLeaks. Now, he shouldn't have been able to do that because you know there should have been. Yeah. No, but, but was it right that a million people had access? Could it have been less people? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would say, A, he shouldn't have been able to access all of the files. Maybe he should have accessed just enough of the files for what he needed to do for his job of work. And B, he shouldn't have been able to transfer the files onto a memory stick and walk out with them. There are tools available that monitor the movement of uh, data through your network. And, and if there's any unusual activity, you should send an alert. Maybe they had that, and maybe nobody bothered paying attention to the alert. I mean, that's what happened at, uh, at Target when they were breached. Uh, just a year and a half ago, they had a, a mega breach over, you know, over 100 million cardholders' accounts because they don't have chip and pin on uh, card payments in the states. So uh, malware had worked its way in from the heating and ventilation supplier system to their hub and spoke uh, retail system, gone to every point of sale device in all of their stores, and was harvesting the card details and pin uh, numbers of every single customer whose payment being processed through a point of sale device, and then. Uh, the exfiltration began, and their uh, FireEye um, intrusion detection system spotted it, but it was Thanksgiving Day coming up and then Christmas coming up, and the management didn't care. They just said, no, no, let's, let's get the sales. Get the money in from customers first. We'll have a look at this later. And, and actually, you know, it was the U.S. law enforcement came to them three weeks later and said, you know, the normal cost of stolen cards uh, in this country is $100, and it's just dropped to $40 in the last three weeks because there's such a massive volume of stolen card uh, details available on the marketplace. And the big common factor is they've all shopped here at Target, so something's going wrong. And, and in fact, it's, 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 it's close to 99% of uh, breaches on retail systems are not discovered by the organization itself. It's, it's either the cardholders themselves complaining, 
or law enforcement stepping in and saying something's going wrong here, and then they lift up the drains and find out what's gone wrong. But, but yeah, there's the, 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 the many problems with, with process and, and, uh, and badly applied technology, but people are completely random elements, and you know, if you trust a person too much, then, then you, you know, you're in trouble. About one person in four in the world is dishonest. Uh, you know, I can't tell you which one in four, but, but I mean, they've done studies where they've dropped uh, wallets on the ground with 20 euros in it and, and a phone number of like, the supposed owner of the, of the wallet. And in, um, in Finland, all 20 wallets were handed back in. In Barcelona, only one wallet was handed back in by a couple who were on holiday from the Netherlands. So, you know, you know it just depends where you are. Um, yeah, but with, with, with web-facing applications, of course, you're open to the world. All the most dishonest people in the world can get at your system. So, uh, so you have to assume you're going to be targeted by skilled and dedicated attackers, not just any old Joe. One more quick question, Becca. Yeah. It seems that uh, there's an opportunity with all these vulnerabilities where 99% of them are still open after a year or something. But um, I guess it should be governments, but it could be a company that uh, if, if they have ways of automated testing for these vulnerabilities, going back to companies and saying, look, you have a breach, and getting them to pay for, for you to uh, close it or, or for the information of where the breach is. Either government or, or, or private company could yeah, do that. There are some companies pay bug bounties. So hackers, uh, you know, white hat hackers, good hackers, ethical hackers, will uh, try to inform companies that they have found a vulnerability in their system and in return for a payment on what it is. And um, yeah, that system to some extent works, but it's you know it's it's not a you know not all companies are paying bug bounties. Not all the people finding the vulnerabilities are honest enough to say. You know, I found this vulnerability and just pay me a couple of hundred quid and, I, and, and I'll tell you the details. Yeah, I mean, the punitive laws, you know, so it's, it's um, if they're applied and people get fined a lot, then there, there'll be some point at which oh, it's cheaper to, to fix the problems than to pay the fines. But a lot of breaches are, are never discovered. I mean, the, one of the biggest problems is cyber espionage. And, it's not like a hacktivist coming into your system and defacing your website saying everybody who works here is stupid. They will get in there and spend years exfiltrating your data very slowly and carefully and stealing all your secrets and billions of dollars of research and development will be taken away without you ever noticing it. And, uh, and that's a big problem. And a lot of the places where this is coming from, like Russia and China, are untouchable. You know, there's no extradition treaty for um, cyber criminals in Russia or for like possibly state-sponsored um, espionage from China. They, they, they can do what they like. And it's especially yeah. easy if we, if we don't stop them. Yeah. We'll have to call, call please. Okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks.